without further ado, please start, Pro Professor Gardinelli. Let me know if I'm in the right screen because I never know. So I, you're good. Uh, you're good. Okay. All right. So um, uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for doing this. I'm always welcome opportunities to tell students uh, about uh, research things that we do, uh, and there is a lot of things going on in BBC. So uh, first of all, I'm I'm a faculty in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, but I'm also associated with uh, what we call now the Institute of uh, Environment, which is uh, in, in the college and, and so on. And I'm also the director of research for one of our training programs, the CRES Cache, uh, which it's an NSF funded uh, project that gives us opportunities to train undergraduate and graduate students uh, doing research in what our faculty normally do. So um, a little bit about what I do, uh, in a nutshell, um, I get paid to go to nice and ugly places to do environmental, organic, analytical chemistry. And in occasion, I, I, I branch into uh, understanding toxicology. So um, I'm mostly an environmental chemist. Um, I do have a degree in chemical oceanography, so I tend to be uh, outside all the time. In that sense, we are a little bit unconventional in what we call our uh, beaker. So this is what I normally show people. This is, uh, this is what I do my experiments and where the students do the research. So it's just out there. So um, if I, I don't expect you to go and read any of these things or, or, or understand all the arrows, but uh, basically each one of the black arrows that you see in this diagram is an environmental process that will bring a pollutant uh, somewhere into a waterway. And we would love to understand what's coming uh, why is it coming and why is that we cannot prevent them to come into a waterway? So we have done, you know, things from oil spills, you know, photo degradation of uh, contaminants. Uh, we had looked for tracers of human uh, impacts in, in the watersheds, uh, pesticides and so on. But lately I've been working in, in something that um, hopefully Dr. Uh, Ned is going to touch on this too is uh, the analysis of unknowns and knowns. So I'm going to give you an explanation of what that means. Um, so again, having uh, that this is my beaker, um, I'm going to give you, is, this is just a one page that I'm going to kind of read, uh, of some projects that are actually going on so you get a flavor of uh, what the students are doing. Uh, we are very interested in a couple of things, microplastics, you know, shows up here. So um, we are uh, looking at how micro and microplastics end up in coastal environments, in particular Biscayne Bay. Uh, we're doing it in two ways. We're just cataloging the plastics that we find, you know, in the beach, in the mangroves, in the sediments, uh, but also understanding how plastics could accumulate other pollutants. So we're trying to fingerprint whatever pollutants um, get loaded into microplastics. Uh, you might be aware of all the controversy of UV filters. This is sunscreen uh, components uh, that have been banned because they could affect uh, uh, marine ecosystems. So we're just trying to understand how they get from your skin uh, into the water, into uh, corals, uh, mostly you know, freight and transport. So do they get photodegrade? Do they get, do they partition to things? How do they actually get uh, from you to the organisms and so on. So there are a couple of students that are working in that kind of uh, project. Uh, this is an analytical challenge because you cannot see most of them. Uh, so that's, that's one of the things that we're doing. Um, if you live in Florida and if you have been listening to Biscayne Bay, fish kills and all that, you know that phosphorus is one of the nutrients that is impacting the bay the most. So we are always trying to find out how to reduce phosphorus, but the only way for us to do that is to understand where the phosphor is and where it's coming from. And one of the big challenges with it is that we don't have good methods to sense it at low levels. So typical detection limits are in the four to six parts per billion. So we are developing techniques to go below that. So I call that the one part per billion challenge. And again, we're using uh, completely novel machines that haven't been used before uh, for this to try to catch up with that. Uh, the next thing, which is what I spend most of my time and uh, most of my students' time is, uh, we're just trying to create what I call the library of water sources. And uh, you can think of uh, doing fingerprints of, of water. We just need to understand um, what the water looks like, what are the chemicals that are in that water, what pollutants, what natural things are in there. 
uh, because if we don't do a fingerprint of water sources, we can't even figure out how they mix and how they end up in the places that we don't want. And uh, we do that by using ultra high resolution mass spectrometry, uh, which I'm gonna give you an example with pictures uh, so you understand what it is. Um, and uh, again, it's a very complex technique uh, that needs a lot of statistics. So there's always opportunity to develop uh, tools and workflows in that area. And uh, finally, what I, you know, I, I want you to you know, take home of you know, what kind of research we do. We're, we're just, uh, we are concentrated on the water that you use, what do you do with it and how do we clean it and where do we put it to protect environments. So uh, we are looking at different things like you know, uh, if you've been reading the news, the septics have been blamed for uh, everything in the planet. Uh, to the contrary of that, I'm an advocate of septics that we need to understand them and, and see how they work. Uh, wastewater treatment plants are great, but unless we start developing uh, what we call advanced oxidation uh, processes, we're not gonna be able to clean the water uh, for whatever we need. So this is an area of, of research that is very active. And then the other thing that we tend to look at is uh, we all like to use water, and sometimes more of what we need. Uh, and then one of the solutions if we use it, but you know what I want to keep all of you in mind that uh, it's better to just reduce the amount of water that you use than, than just you know to get it dirty and have it clean. So again, this is a flavor of uh, some of the things that we do. There's a lot more, but you know in 10 minutes, uh, I can't tell you all that, but I'll be glad to talk to you about it. So I'm gonna go through an example of what we call the analysis of unknown unknowns. So this is your typical analytical challenge. We are looking for a needle in a haystack and you can do that in a number of ways. You can start bringing each one of those uh, pieces of hay out of it until you find the needle. Or if you're a smart analytical chemist, you will just take that bale and then take an X-ray of it and then you'll find the needle very quickly. So all we're trying to do here is to develop techniques that will allow us not to only look at that specific needle, but look at every piece of hay in that haystack. And that's where I'm heading with, with this. So we call that a three-phase approach. The first one is known as target analysis. So if you look at this picture, uh, clearly the target was to take a picture of, uh, of uh, President Obama uh, in, in uh, a school. Uh, so we know what we're looking for and we just go for it and we take a picture. Uh, we do more than that, which is called non-target analysis in which we wanna take a picture and then take the president out of the main focus of that picture. And you start seeing other stuff. You see the teachers, you see people with the phones, you see the kids interacting with each other. But what we're doing now with chemistry is doing uh, unknown unknown. And then I don't know if you notice it, but if I manage to take this picture, I can analyze all the things that are not very evident in the picture. And in this is one example, is that right? Uh, so uh, most of you may not have seen that, uh, so that's information that is usually missing with chemical analysis. And we're just trying to take the picture and figure out everything that is going on, despite the fact that we were not looking for this information. So that's what I, what I said I want to do fingerprinting of water. Uh, so a couple of examples, you know, just to, to wrap this up. Um, we look at tracers of uh, human intrusion in the wastewater. And one of the ones that you are familiar with is Splenda. We, take Splenda in almost everything that it's sweet these days if you don't want to use sugar. So this is analysis of Splenda. This was done by a high school team uh, a couple of summers ago. So they did uh, analysis of bottled water, um, uh, things that you refill in the supermarket. These are all the ones on your, on your left side. This is concentrations in parts per trillion. And then they went and collect tap water in the places that we all live. And you know, the tap water has more Splenda than uh, your clean water from the supermarket. That shouldn't be the case. Splenda should not be in your tap water. So clearly there is a connection between a source of drinking water and the wastewater that we put up there that we need to explore. And uh, there's no other source of Splenda other than a human. So unless you took it, there's no way that you can put it in the environment. Uh -huh. Sorry. So, um, just to give you an idea of where things are coming from, uh, that's the, the next question, is all right, where is it coming from? So uh, this is um, a map of a place near my home. This is during a state, and these are concentrations of Splenda going from the canal to the bay. 
So clearly the canals in Dave County do have more splendor than the bay. That's a that's good thing that the bay is not, is not that contaminated. Uh, but then this will be splendor concentrations in all the stations in the canals and the bay. And this one here is a septic tank underneath my house. Uh, so clearly septics are a source of something. Uh, and it wouldn't be bad if the septics are not connected to anything. But just to remind you of something in Miami-Dade County that is called the Miami-Dade Lake Belt. These are all quarries that were done for mining uh, limestone so we can build houses. And the way they do this is they just blast the limestone and then dig a hole. Uh, and this is where some of our drinking water is coming from. So uh, there's, there's potential connections between the urban area, those quarries, and the places that we take the drinking water. So this is an early indication that uh, we need to put some effort on water treatment. Um, other things that we like to do is we like to get citizens to do the science uh, or help doing, us doing the science. Uh, you have seen tidal uh, flood waters from sea level rise. So we are trying to develop um, a, a kit that you can take home. Uh, it's based on a, on a coliform plate and then you put your water sample you cook it, uh, you incubate it in a, in, a, uh, in a cooler for 24 hours. Uh, the plate develops in color. So this thing does have a UV light and a regular uh, white light. Take a picture with your cell phone and it will tell you uh, via an application of if your water has coliforms or not. So we have done all this process except the develop of the app. So again, you don't have to be a chemist to do some research here you can help us develop the technology that will bring the information to, to people. And we have several of these things uh, going on. So we want to involve the citizens to, to help us uh, because they're there all the time. And uh, I think with that, uh, you know, again, sorry for uh, the short explanation. Uh, this is my information. I, my labs are in BBC. Uh, and I do have an office in, uh, in the main campus as well. So if anybody wants to uh, drop me an email or, or maybe give, a call, give me a call, you know, I'll be glad to talk about uh, research opportunities. And uh, the last one is if you want to know more about Biscayne Bay or what uh, Chris Cachet that you can, you can always go to uh, that page where there's a wealth of information of the research and the resources that we have for students. And uh, I guess that's it. So. All right, thank you, Professor Cardinali. So I will assume that everyone can see my screen. Um, so yeah, so first, thanks, Paul, for the invite. And I'm excited. I'm just going to talk briefly about what my lab is up to over the past few years. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the deep sea. So most of my research right now is happening in the deep sea. And we're not only studying biodiversity, so a big part of my interests lay in biodiversity discoveries, but we're also studying, we're an evolutionary biology lab, and we study the evolution of both bioluminescence and vision in the twilight zone. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit specifically about where that zone is located. So as uh, Paul mentioned, uh, my name is Heather Bracken Grissom. I'm located on the Biscayne Bay campus. I was recently appointed to be the assistant director of the coastlines and oceans division. I'm also an associate professor and I have been um, at FIU since 2012. Uh, my lab is located on the Biscayne Bay campus and um, it's right on the other side. And this picture right here is just showing the marine science building where my lab and my office is located. So we call my lab the Crestomics Lab um, because we use this, my whole lab is basically studying crustacean evolution. And we use this integrated approach. We combine something called taxonomy, which is the science of studying, uh, naming and classifying organisms, describing animals. And we, we combine taxonomy with genetics and genomic approaches to kind of tell us something about how crustaceans have evolved across their 500 million years of existence. So there's three major research themes in my lab. The first is what I hinted to a little bit earlier, and that's characterizing biodiversity. So a lot of my students, my grad students, myself included, we, we describe new species, we descri describe new dis 
distributional ranges of species. And we really try to figure out what is there. What are those fundamental units of biodiversity? And I'm going to talk briefly about a project we have going on that studies biodiversity in the deep sea in just a second. So once those units of biodiversity are described and diagnosed, we use something called phylogenetics or phylogeny. And this, is, this um, term describes how animals are related to one another. So phylogenetics is a field of science that studies the evolutionary relatedness across different species. And so we're really interested in not only defining what is there, but also figuring out how biodiversity is related to one another. We are getting really into adaptation. So how, how animals are adapted to their environment and specifically studying uh, bioluminescence and vision in the deep sea. I'm gonna talk briefly again about a little project we've been working, or a pretty big project we have been working on about um, life and light in the deep sea, how animals are using bioluminescence and how their visual systems might be adapted to detect different bioluminescent signals. We combine all three of these interests to tell us something about the evolutionary history of an organism all the way from population to species level. And again, this is my lab down here, the Christomics lab. And here's my lab website, brackengrissomlab.com. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about our lab and what we do, you can just go to that website. So I told you I study crustaceans and these are an excellent animal to use as, as a model to study all kinds of evolutionary patterns and processes. Um, I've studied crustaceans ever since I was an undergrad. So right where you're at, um, I started getting interested in invertebrates and specifically crustaceans, which are your um, different groups like your barnacles and your crabs and your lobsters, um, your krill, all of these different animals. Um, and I've continued studying them into uh, being a professor. So why are they, why are they kind of a great model organism to study different evolutionary patterns and processes? Well, they are a species rich group, about 70,000 species. They're important economically. So I'm sure that some of you might um, be familiar with uh, the spiny lobster, which is, you know, what we eat here in Florida. Down here, I have a picture of a crawfish boil. You know, we celebrate these things um, and they're part of social and cultural livelihoods across the globe. So they're economically important, not only for fisheries and aquaculture and mariculture, but we celebrate them in, in festivities and part of um, our cultural relevance. They're morphologically unique and this picture kind of displays some of that diversity and they can be found everywhere. So freshwater, marine, um, Arctic to the tropics. So they're really, really all over the place. And they have a, a really just a unique set of adaptations. So I told you I studied the deep sea and I wanna tell you what I mean by that term deep sea because it can mean a whole bunch of different things. So if you're looking kind of at the cross section of like our different um, ocean realms, we have the epipelagic from zero to 200 meters. But where we really do the majority of the work in my lab is down in this mesopelagic and into the bachypelagic. This zone right here um, also contains the highest abundance of bioluminescent organisms, and it's also called the twilight zone. If we look at the diversity in the twilight zone, if I can orient you to the zone and what lives there, you can see it's extremely diverse. And a lot of people don't realize the diversity that the twilight zone or the mesopelagic zone has. So here in red, this kind of red cloud highlights some different examples of crustaceans. So shrimp and krill and copepods and um, different crustaceans, which I'm interested in. But there's a huge diversity of fish and other invertebrates like, um, cnidarians and tenophores and there's siphonophores. So there's a diversity, a lot of fish, cephalopods, squid and octopus also. So the three major components I say, I think that make up the twilight zone are crustaceans, fish, cephalopods, and then the jellies, which are um, a variety of, of jellyfish and tenophores and siphonophores. 
These animals are extremely important to our oceans. They really provide, um, they, they provide a link between our surface waters and our deep ocean waters. So they circulate the water and they play a very critical role in something called the biological carbon pump. And this describes how carbon is kind of recycled and sequestered through our oceans. Most of these animals participate in the largest migration on the planet. And this is one thing that most people don't really know exists. These animals, every single night, they migrate hundreds to sometimes even a thousand meters to reach these surface waters at night. So at night, they migrate up and they feed on the zooplankton in these um, nutrient-rich uh, surface waters. And then when the sun rises and they become more detectable to predators because the sunlight uh, becomes more intense, they migrate back down. And so they, they move carbon through this system. And so they're a really important, um, they're a really important uh, component of this carbon pump through this behavior, which is called diel vertical migration. Okay, I'm going to talk just briefly about two projects which we're really excited about in my lab right now. So the first project is just to document the biodiversity that exists in this mesopelagic zone. So I told you what are the, you know, we're defining these fundamental units of biodiversity. So this is a project that a bunch of my different undergraduates are involved in, or my PhD students, some of my postdocs. And really we're going out there on research cruises um, and we're sampling the deep sea and we're trying to figure out what's there because a lot of the deep sea biodiversity is unknown. This is just some examples of pictures of animals that we've collected as part of these research cruises. Um, some of these things might look familiar, like this is a, you know, something like a shrimp-like animal. Um, but some of these things might look really unfamiliar to you. This is something called a deep sea blind lobster. It's, uh, it's relatively rare. It's only found in the deep sea and it's, it's a close relative to lobsters. This is a spiny, uh, spiny lobster. So I think most of you are familiar with what the adult looks like. This is a baby spiny lobster. It's called the Phylosoma larvae and they can, they can live in the water column for up to 12 months. Um, and this is a hermit crab. We have some shrimp down here and this is a baby crab. So another goal of this project is to also try to match these babies to their adult counterparts. Some more examples of crustacean deep sea biodiversity. Um, I think these groups are really cool right here. This one right here, these, these are anthropods. And you can see that these anthropods, you would think that this is a head right here, but this is actually the anthropod's eye. Uh, this is called a schistosoma anthropod and this entire structure isn't the head, it's an eye. And you can see that here in this anthropod here in this anthropod. So I also told you I'm interested in vision. So I'm interested in how animals see in the deep sea. And some of that is looking at um, how eyes have evolved in the deep sea or lack of eyes. So this anthropod is completely blind. It has no, it's lost its, uh, its eyes in the deep sea. So we are, we're collecting these things, we're bringing them up and we're character, we're, we're trying to identify them using morphology, but we're also identifying them using genetic techniques. So we use something called DNA barcoding, which is a really kind of traditional method. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds like. So just like if you were to buy a piece of fruit and it has that barcode, that stamp on the piece of fruit, we do the same thing, but we use a piece of DNA from the animal. So we sequence a piece of DNA from a very specific gene region. This gene region has enough variation to allow us to identify all of these animals down to species level. So it's like a genetic fingerprint for these animals in the deep sea. So we not only visually identify them using like morphological, physical characters, but we also are, are doing DNA barcodes for every single thing we pull up so that they have a genetic fingerprint. So why is this work important? Um, you know, this work is important. I just kind of want to emphasize this study that was just 
just uh, published this year in, two, in two, uh, 2020. It's an opinion piece in uh, PNAS, which is one of the top uh, leading science journals. Um, but the deep sea is under some threat right now. There's mining, there's deep water drilling, and and these you know these new these new um, avenues to explore the deep sea and mine the deep sea can result in a lot of different unknown consequences. Um, this is a figure taken from this paper that shows some of the consequences of, of deep water mining. It produces a plume, um, which could impair vision. It also is very noisy. And so I just encourage you to read this piece. And these are just some of the potential effects of, of deep water mining. Um, and I don't talk about deep sea drilling, but there's a, a big push for deep sea drilling, especially in the, the Gulf of Mexico. So we need to know what's there to learn how to properly manage and conserve things in the deep sea. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna talk about briefly is just the evolution of bioluminescence and vision in the deep sea. And so this is kind of spearheaded by some of the, the two postdocs in my lab right now. Um, so bioluminescence is extremely common in the marine environment, less common in the terrestrial environment, but it's almost the, ex, um, the norm rather than the exception in, in uh, the oceans. These are some pictures I took of deep sea coral bioluminescence on a, a mission in 2012 um, in the Gulf of Mexico. This is coral bioluminescence here, sea anemone, and also this is a beautiful picture of a sea pen that we took pictures of bioluminescing. Beautiful blue, and it also has green bioluminescence. So bioluminescence is also different colors um, in the ocean. Okay, what I'm starting to study is specifically a, a family of deep sea shrimp that have these different modes of bioluminescence. The first is in the form of this um, bioluminescent kind of smoke screen. So it can be described as this bioluminescent vomit that they emit when they get scared. So these shrimp secrete, secrete this bioluminescent um, smoke screen to be used against predation. And this is what it looks like in the, this is what it looks like in the deep sea um, in, in, a, in an aquarium. We took this video on one of our research cruises. Um, this is a, Opaliforid shrimp emitting this bioluminescent smoke screen when it was provoked um, in the aquaria, in an aquarium setting. So normally it would be, you know, emitting this smoke screen and also kind of escaping at the same time, but it's in a V tank, so it can't, it can't escape here. So that's the first mode. The second mode of bioluminescence, and this is what I'm particularly interested in, is these light organs, these photophores. So these photophores are light emitting organs. They're, they're located across the entire body of the shrimp. Um, they're also in a lot of fish and cephalopods. You're probably very familiar with light organs in deep sea fish and, and squid. Um, these are used for, for camouflage. So you can imagine that when these light organs are turned on and you are a predator swimming below this fish or this shrimp and you're looking up these light organs emit a light that camouflage them against downwelling sunlight that's coming in through the surface. All right, so they perform, a, they, they're used as a form of camouflage. So what we're really interested in is, are these light organs used beyond camouflage? So we're asking about the role of these, these light organs. Um, my lab has recently found that these light organs don't only emit light, they're like little light detectors all across the body. So why do these light organs actually have to detect light and emit light? So we're asking different questions like that. And we're also asking how the visual systems, these eyes and the sensory systems are adapted to maybe detect these different colors of bioluminescence or are they used in, are these light organs also used for communication? Okay, so we also ask similar questions in cave environments. Half of my lab is working in marine caves. We ask very similar questions. A quick picture of my lab, and and that's um, all I have for you. Uh, so um, my name's Fen uh, Filen. I'm a professor of biochemistry. I'm from the uh, department of chemistry, biochemistry. I mean. MMC, I'm not in BBC, 
So most of the students, my understanding is the in PPC, right? Uh, so I'm also affiliated with the uh, institute called the Biomonic Science Institute. And uh, we are in the, uh, we call it in a research building called a, you know, AHC4. Uh, and my office is uh, 222 and my lab is 242. Um, so if you are, have a, uh, ever been the, the MMC, uh, we are the we are the building, um, uh, you know, face to the uh, A Street. Actually, you know, we have two garage, a parking garage in in front of us. Uh, one is uh, you know uh, PG Five, another one is uh, uh, Red Car Garage. So the PG Five has a police station. So we are, uh, you know, if you know where the police station is, and the across the street is uh, the building. Uh, of uh, my lab located. Um, so I will introduce a few, a couple of uh, projects in my lab. I, I mean, <clears throat> so I, I will show you what I have. I, uh, we, are, we are studying a, uh, a, a, you know, a DNA topology. Let me show all these. That's, uh, you know, DNA topology and transcription copy DNA supercalling. And uh, uh, well, apparently, you know, and uh, the left right here is the drawing. I mean, the right actually is the, the, the real image. So what this image we did is that, uh, uh, you know, we uh, we put this DNA onto the mica surface and we use a, a microscope called uh, atomic force microscope. And the image is the DNA. This is the, the plasmid DNA, and then that's the plasmid DNA. And you can clearly see that that's the protein. I mean, that's the DNA. And the, the so one thing this protein did is very cool. You can see that. You can clearly see this, this open circle, and that's something tangling right here. We say that that's, that's super calling, that's called DNA topology. And that this, you know, two dots, the two proteins actually can separate that. You can separate these two uh, two group of DNA. I mean, you know, that is the first time maybe you know we ever see this. I mean, uh, so we published that uh, um, in 2011 uh, in my lab uh, and uh, the, in a journal. I mean, called the uh, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. Uh, right? It's okay journal, but uh, you know, and 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 then occasionally we have some paper will show up there. But you know that's the one of them. You know we call this is called DNA topological barriers. Right? You know um, we are scared doing that. But but the, the second project I have, I, I need to make sure I, I don't over my time is the we try to discover uh, inhibitors of DNA gyrase and the other top isomerases. And the, the image here is just a you know MTB. Uh, DNA top isomerases and uh, you know uh, complex with the DNA and you can if you can see carefully right here that's a drug or the ciprofloxacin or fluoroquinolones. The reason for that because uh, you know the DNA gyrus is the target of the modern uh, you know antibiotics. I mean uh, you may know that antibiotic resistance is a big issue right now. We have a problem with COVID nineteen right. And uh, it's a little bit too late. We try to uh, decode the drug, but you know we are still doing this. I mean, there's a few labs doing that. But can you imagine? Uh, you know, in the future, if we have a pandemic uh, with bacteria, and we we have you know multi uh, you know multi drug resistant bacteria, we there's no drug can treat it. I mean, you know, it it we may you know it may happen. Right, I mean that can happen. I mean, you know, we know that we never thought about that. Uh, you know, virus. Uh, you know, we can have an epidemic, but uh, you know, bacteria is also uh, equally uh, dangerous. I mean, the pandemic with the bacteria is very popular in you know in human history. I mean, you know, in some extreme cases, ninety percent of a human uh, population uh, were wiped out. I mean, you know. So we need to find more, you know, uh, antibiotics for sure. But the problem is that, you know, in last 30 years, I don't think we have a major breakthrough in the drug discovery. So that's why we need, we need a, you know, 
uh, we need to uh, we need to put an uh, effort to do this. And the fluoroquinolone, uh, you know, the target is uh, DNA gyrus. But my lab actually, we recently established a few methods to looking for these drugs. So currently, in what in an actually funded project. We discovered more than maybe close to 100 different gyrus inhibitors. And some of them, hopefully, they can end with a potential antibiotics. But of course, a drug, you know, we, we, we are not only, you know, you know we got, only got a half a million dollars from federal uh, age funding agency. If you're talking about a drug, it's talking a billion dollars a project. I mean, you know, you know, we have a long way to there. But that's the first step. I mean, we have to go to the lab and do the do our work first, right? So the the third project, uh, we are also looking at uh, a human uh, proteins called the, the mammalian high mobility group protein eighty hook two. Uh, the reason these proteins is, uh, is embryonic proteins and uh, is only expressed in embryo stages. It's multifunctional. Uh, the, the reason is a very, very interesting protein, okay? It's a, it's a, it's a related cancer. It related to uh, stem cell use, and uh, intelligence, and also human highs. I mean, and it's extremely very simple proteins. I mean, you, we did a lot of work uh, in the past, and then we think uh, right now we, are, we can target the protein for drug discoveries. Actually, we, 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 we just published a paper, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, on Monday, and uh, demonstrate uh, actually that can be targeted and we find some inhibitors for that. Okay, I will show you the final project. I mean, I have, okay, I have two more minutes. And also we are starting a bug called the uh, H. pylori. And the H. pylori, you know, well, it's very popular. Uh, you know, half of the population in, uh, on this planet uh, was infected by this bug. And what is the cause? The cause, you know, they're living the living the the human stomach. I mean, cause, uh, you know, the, the you know some some uh, extreme cases cause uh, gastric uh, carcinoma, the cancer, right? I mean, you know, that that's what the uh, what we have. If you have a stomach, uh, you know, uh, discomfort, your doctors, your uh, gastro doctors, uh, you know, first things they okay, let's check H. pylori, okay? So. Uh, my lab, you know, right now we have a setup here. We can study the H. pylori for for the for for the different purposes. Uh, you know, H. pylori living the stomachs, right? So the the the, the, the kind of don't like the oxygen. So we have to put in into a there's an instrument, that, you know, limit the oxygen. It's only living the six percent the oxygen environments. So we need these cages to grow them. And also, you know, I have a you know biosafety uh, cabinet to grow that, and then we have uh, uh, we have the we have the incubator uh, for the uh, you know human cells. So you can study the uh, bacteria cell interaction with this, and also we have a microscope to look at that. But this we just started that. I mean, we, we just started the project. So in, in terms of requirements, I mean, you know, I I, I like freshmen and sophomores. I mean, the, the great, I mean, the, the early is better. And of course, you know, if you're living in the BBC, there will be a little bit more problematic, you know, because it's kind of, you know, like two hours away from MMC, right? So you may want to move to here. And the biochemistry, uh, biology chemistry majors are good. And uh, you do need the motivations. I'm particularly interested in students that, that try to get the graduate degree or the PhD and then I hope you can work in 15, 20 hours in the lab. And that's all I have. Uh, you, you know. Last presentation, everybody probably already hungry, but <laughs> um, I, I promise I will be brief. <laughs> I'm gonna take a lot of time. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the invitation, Paul. Yeah, so as he said, um, I'm, um, I'm Dr. Natalia um, Pinetto. Um, I have here, you see like my, I have a website. So in case like you wanna have a uh, look, look at and read a little bit more into the research and also um, my email address. I'm a, an assistant professor. I actually just joined FIU um, now in 2020. So I'm not even a year yet here. 
um, as assistant professor, even though I have worked here before as a postdoc. Um, anyway, uh, I'm in BBC, you know, as hopefully most of you. Uh, my lab is located in MSB uh, 2020 and 220. And my office is at 357. So, if, you know, but right now, probably because of COVID, if you have any doubts or you want to talk to me, um, even though I just actually started, I'm really um, I'm amazed actually how many students, you know, and um, undergrad, I'm going to be talking a little bit more later about it. So, but first, um, about my, a little bit about like, you know, my background and the research area. Um, so I'm actually more concentrated into the environmental bioanalytical uh, chemistry, um, more specifically looking at assessment of sources, distribution, fade and position health effects from emerging contaminants, you know, um, and a development and improvement of analytical method uh, based on mass spectrometry, um, as well as um, also interest in biomonitoring and, you know, discovery of uh, bio, uh, bioindicators of exposure. Some of the um, specific um, ongoing project in my lab is um, assessment of poly and peripherodinated al alkyl substances in environmental samples in, in South Florida. You're probably be asking, okay, what is what is that? So um, it calls a PFAS. So maybe some of you have already seen in the news um, since this compounds is actually um, having um, a lot of media attention right now. They are basically used as um, water, you know, oil repellent. So like all the Teflon from pans, you know, um, all our uh, water repellents clothes. So actually these compounds are present in, you know, all our daily uh, consumer products and, and they have been found to be uh, reaching out to water bodies and in the environment and accumulating it um, into animals and also into humans. Um, another project is on um, phthalates in surface and drinking water. Uh, also, we're looking at um, their distribution, seasonal and spatial distribution in South Florida. I'm going to be um, talking a little bit more about it. Um, and also, um, similar, like uh, before, Dr. Gardinali already talked about non target analysis. So, we are interested in looking actually um, into the outdoor dust and trying to assess chemicals that are present, for example, in dust and there for there and trying to identify um, bioindicators, you know, from um, Saharan dust. Um, another project also there is in collaboration with some uh, people from uh, biology is we are also, we have recently developed um, lipidomic analysis of coral, of staghorn corals to assess variations um, caused by anthropogenic contaminant exposure. So I mentioned before like about emerging that, I mean, most of my study is looking at emerging contaminants. So what are emerging contaminants or some people call it also contaminants of emerging concern. So this term is actually used to describe um, several uh, pollutants. You know, here we have some examples such as hormones, artificial sweeteners such as uh, what um, Dr. Daniele mentioned before, some pharmaceuticals, flame retardant, um, the fluorinated chemicals, remember that I mentioned before, the PFAS, uh, plasticizers, uh, antimicrobial fragrances. So um, this uh, this, most of these contaminants, they have been detected in the environmental, in the environment, in water bodies, sediments, and, and in fish tissues. And they are known to cause, you know, both ecological and also human health impacts. And they are normally typically not regulated under uh, some environmental laws, or sometimes you do have some regula uh, regulations, but they are very uh, more restricted for a specific one, but not for the whole classes. Um, 
So I mentioned uh, before about Fitalit. So Fitalit, so one of our, my projects is like, you know, um, one of my, uh, my postdoc actually, and also we have an undergrad student, uh, Melissa, which is working on, on in the, in, into the environment. So these Fitalit, they, they are used as plasticizers. So actually, they are added to the plastic, you know, they're the ones that provide this softed, um, you know, um, the softer aspect from the plastic. So, you know, so they have been using the plastic because Mac. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Quinte, you were, you're breaking up. Uh, if you can make sure you get like better signal, that'd be awesome. There you go, we can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah. So they have, um, oh, okay. Now I got the demand. Okay, hope that, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Okay, so again, I was talking about fetalids and they're using as plasticizers, you know, such as in plastic and in cosmetic manufacturing, the industry, industries, and also food packaging materials or from PVC uh, products. Um, as you can see here, you see like this is a, a basic structure from uh, from these uh, compounds. As you can see here in this picture, as you see like they can come off from leaching from plastic products. You see here in, um, and you see here in Miami, these are some pictures from Miami. You see when you have like a huge accumulation from marine debris where we have a bunch of uh, plastic bottles and plastic materials. So these compounds, you know, they normally can be coming out from leaching from this, um, these materials and then going into the nearby uh, water bodies. So as I said here, we have been sampling here. You see the map, we have been sampling both um, for actually tap water as well. There's the blue dots. And then um, also for surface water, that's the one here in yellow. So we have been sampling all across Miami, you know, um, and here you see like in this graph is some of the preliminary results that we have so far for the six compounds that have been actually uh, from the six compounds are the ones that have been more often um, found in, in, the, um, in water in the environment. Uh, from this only three of them actually are regulated. And these compounds like very important thing is they are known as endocrine disruptor chemicals, you know, which means that they have the capability of interfere with the body endocrine system, and they can produce, you know, adverse uh, developmental, uh, reproductive, uh, neurological, and immune system effects in both humans and uh, wildlife. So uh, currently, my research group, um, I have like you know two postdocs, Danny and Leila. They're kind of, they're working with me. Um, I have a graduate student, Shuron, that is uh, working on um, the PFAS project. And I have three undergrads right now. So Morgan, which is also working with PFAS, and Melissa, which is working with Vitalis, that I briefly talked about it. And then have uh, another undergrad, Leo, that is going to be actually working at, um, that I didn't mention, but it's a project on um, uh, assessment of uh, physiological stress in fish uh, by measure of cortisol, uh, cortisol hormone. So just to talk briefly here, these are some of the resources that we had available in the labs. Uh, we have a GCMS, which we use it for the vitality analysis. We have a solid uh, phase extraction system for pre-concentration of water samples that are being using for for PFAS, and we have a brand new instrument, um, LC MS MS system, um, that we use it for analysis of uh, perforated compounds, um, and also a HPLC UV system. Um, and that's all that I have. In. Awesome, thank you, Professor Quinte. Anybody have any questions for her?